Thanks very much, uh, Rod, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, having me present as part of this uh, webinar series, uh, lecture series. Um, the topic of the presentation uh, that I'm going to give is on pain and exercise progression uh, during hamstring strain injury rehabilitation. Um, for those of you who uh, maybe haven't even met me or, or seen me present before, my name is Jack Hickey. Um, and I'm an accredited exercise physiologist from Melbourne, Australia, and I work as a lecturer and researcher um, at the Australian Catholic University uh, here in Melbourne. Um, I work quite closely uh, with Dr. David Opar and Dr. Ryan Timmons in the hamstring injury space, um, and also a bunch of other colleagues as part of the Sprint Research Centre uh, here at ACU. I'll uh, just bring up my presentation slides here. Okay, so as the title of the presentation suggests, uh, we're going to be touching on pain and progressive eccentric exercise during uh, rehabilitation and perhaps some alternative strategies to accelerating uh, the progression of eccentric loading throughout hamstring injury rehab. So to start off, we want to think about as a rehabilitation practitioner, what is our aim? Well, our aim if we're working with someone with hamstring strain injury is to get them back on the field and back playing sport. And to do that, we're going to implement a number of different rehabilitation interventions, um, pre predominantly exercise-based uh, interventions, and most of them will be something to do with progressive hamstring loading. Now, when we uh, think about hamstring injury rehab, this is just one aspect of hamstring injury rehab. We also have other treatments that are prescribed, might be passive therapies, stretching or flexibility exercises, exercises for other muscles of the lumbopelvic region, as well as running technique drills have also become quite popular. But with all of these different types of exercise or different types of rehab intervention, sometimes as rehab practitioners, we can get distracted by the, the new intervention or the, the new fat on the market. And that means that we can actually get a little bit distracted by these and perhaps not have as much focus on progressive hamstring loading as we should throughout the rehab process. And so I'm not here today to talk about the efficacy of one intervention versus the other, but just make clear that what we're going to focus on in this presentation and what we have focused on in our research has been more this concept of progressive hamstring loading. So when we talk about what that actually means, when we talk about ha progressive hamstring loading, what we're really talking about is progressive strength training. Um, and typically what we want to include is some form of long length hip dominant a hamstring exercise, such as a 45 degree uh, Roman chair hip extension shown up the top, or an eccentric knee flexor based movement, such as a Nordic hamstring exercise, because we know that these are beneficial exercises for promoting positive adaptations in the hamstrings. But we also know that the most specific stimulus for the hamstrings in terms of uh, returning an athlete to most running based sports is going to be exposure to high speed running. So Obviously, the hamstrings get loaded progressively as we increase in running speeds, particularly above about 80% of our maximal velocity. So we want to be including adequate exposure to this throughout the rehabilitation process as well. Now, when we think about rehab, there's sometimes barriers to implementing progressive hamstring loading. One of the potential barriers to implementing progressive loading following an acute hamstring strain injury is pain. If you look at the literature, one of the most common guidelines seen, irrespective of the type of exercise intervention, is to only perform and progress exercise in the complete absence of pain, or where pain is rated as a zero out of 10, or zero on a zero to 10 scale. Now, this is okay if rehab lasts a long time because you can allow pain to dissipate and then still have adequate exposure to progressive hamstring loading. However, particularly in elite sporting environments, we know that there's pressure to accelerate return to play clearance and get athletes back on the field as quickly as possible. And this perhaps shortens the window of time that we actually have available for implementing that progressive hamstring loading. The potential issues with that are that we know that following hamstring strain injury and return to play clearance, athletes with a previous hamstring strain injury often display residual deficits in key variables associated with hamstring strain injury risk. You can see down the bottom left here, um, an image of my colleague Ryan Timmons assessing biceps femoris long head muscle architecture. And we know that fascicle length is associated with hamstring injury risk and those with a previous hamstring injury often have shortened biceps femoris long head fascicles. On the right, you see uh, someone performing an eccentric hamstring exercise, the Nordic, Nordic curl, 
and we can measure that uh, using the Nordboard device and having a look at eccentric knee flexor strength. We also know that athletes following a hamstring strain injury are often weak. And so we have these two residual risk factors of short fascicles and weakness during eccentric knee flexor contractions to potentially increase our risk of suffering a re-injury because these things maybe haven't been addressed throughout the rehabilitation period. So when we sort of took a look at this um, a number of years ago now, we thought, well, how can we maybe short circuit this um, lack of progressive hamstring loading in rehab? We're probably not going to be able to ask athletes to stay in rehab for longer and prolong that return to play clearance time. So we need to look at the other barrier, which is pain, and consider is this or are these residual deficits in hamstring structure and function an outcome of no pain, no gain? And this was a concept that we explored in a randomised control trial, which was published in JOSPT uh, last year. Uh, and basically what we did in this study is we had a group of uh, athletes, uh, 43 of them, uh, with clinically confirmed acute hamstring strain injuries present to us. Now, these individuals all followed the exact same rehabilitation program. What was included in that rehabilitation program was focused on progressive hamstring loading. Uh, they followed this program all the way through to achieving return to play clearance. And so what you can see here is from the start of rehabilitation, all participants in this study were exposed to three exercises. These were three bilateral hamstring exercises, starting at the top left with a 45 degree hamstring bridge. In the middle, you can see an eccentric sliding leg curl. And then on the right, we have a 45 degree hip extension. All three of the exercises are started bilateral to allow the athlete to selectively load or unload their injured leg uh, based on what they can tolerate. Then each of those exercises was individually progressed. So the hamstring bridge goes from bilateral to unilateral. The 45 degree hip extension, the same. And then with this sliding leg curl, we had two exercises that were added. One was a unilateral sliding leg curl shown down the bottom left. And the other was the Nordic hamstring exercise. So each exercise was progressed once the athlete could perform the bilateral, the appropriate bilateral variation for a prescribed repetition range. In addition to these strengthening exercises, we also included a progressive running protocol. And this protocol was based on the work of Amy Silder and her colleagues from back in 2013. And what we did is we used a 50 metre uh, running space that we had available to us uh, on site here at the university. And over that 50 metre distance, we progressed our athletes from a walk jog uh, progression, moving to a jog run jog, and then eventually up to a run sprint run, where one of our final return to play clearance criteria was the ability to run with 100% effort with no pain or apprehension. So all participants followed that rehab protocol. The only difference was we had 22 participants who were allocated to a pain-free rehabilitation group. So they were only allowed to perform and progress within absolute pain-free limits, as is commonly recommended. Then we also had a pain threshold group. Now, this group was allowed to continue performing and progressing exercise up to a limit of four out of 10 on that zero to 10 numeric pain rating scale. Now, our two primary outcome measures were did this change how long it took our athletes to get back to return to play clearance? And also, did it impact on their risk of re-injury at six-month follow-up time point? Let's start by having a look at the return to play clearance time. What you can see here is uh, a step plot where on the y-axis we have the percentage of participants in each group, and on the x-axis you've got the number of days following acute hamstring strain injury. The blue shows the pain-free group and the orange shows the pain threshold group. Now you can see that there's a bit of overlap between the two groups here, but if we actually then plot a horizontal line at the median or to represent the median return to play clearance time, we can see the pain-free group took 15 days to get back and the pain threshold group 17 days. But there's a large amount of overlap in the 95% confidence intervals, which basically means there was no statistical difference between our two groups. So both had relatively brief periods of rehabilitation, but no difference or no change by allowing low levels of pain. If we take a look at the return to play clearance time, just on another figure here, showing each individual data point, again, you can see the amount of overlap and the fact that there was no statistical or no clinically meaningful difference between the two groups. The other outcome was having a look at 
uh, those athletes who went on to sustain a re-injury six months after being cleared. And there was no difference between the two groups, at least from the point of view if we had relatively low uh, overall participant numbers, but also relatively low numbers of re-injuries. So only two participants in each group, so less than 10% re-injury rate uh, overall, which you know is a relatively uh, successful outcome uh, considering some prior work showing some slightly higher rates of re-injury. Now, if there's no major difference in return to play clearance times or uh, re-injury rates, then we might think, well, what's the benefit of perhaps eliciting some pain uh, during rehab exercises? And for that, we actually really need to look at the changes in hamstring muscle structure and function. So we actually measured eccentric knee flexor strength throughout the study whenever they performed the Nordic hamstring exercise and rehabilitation. And on the x-axis, we can see eccentric knee flexor strength as measured by the Nord board. And to provide some context to our data, we can also plot a vertical line uh, crossing that x-axis, which is taken from Ryan Timmons' PhD work um, in elite soccer players. It shows that about 337 newtons of strength is the statistical cut point for increased or decreased risk of hamstring strain injury. We can then do the same for biceps femoris long head fascicle length, which we measured uh, before every rehabilitation session. And again, we can plot the horizontal line here at 10.56 centimetres. Now, this gives us a nice graph with four quadrants, where down the bottom left, we're considered to be short and weak and at greater risk of hamstring injury, or the top right, where we want our athletes to be long and strong and somewhat protected from hamstring strain injury. From the start of rehab, we can see most of our participants sat within the short and weak category, but by the end, they were able to make a large shift up to that long and strong category. Now, this is looking at all of our participants lumped together. If we actually then take a look at the group level, what we see is that both groups ended up in the long and strong category, but if you pay particular attention to the x-axis and eccentric knee flexor strength, there was a difference between the two groups and greater strength gains in that pain threshold group. So the first take-home message here is that following hamstring strain injury, even in relatively short periods of return to play clearance or brief periods of rehabilitation, we are able to make adaptations in terms of increasing fascicle length and eccentric knee flexor strength. But perhaps it's not so much a case of no pain, no gain, but perhaps no pain, slightly less gain, which certainly isn't as catchy of a title. But basically, if we allow low levels of pain during exercise, we might get some additional benefits, particularly with strengthening the hamstrings throughout rehabilitation. Now, because we saw these big improvements in terms of strength and fascicle length in both groups, we were actually recently gone back and had another look at our data to take a closer look at how well did we expose our athletes to eccentric loading, because we know this is what leads to changes in fascicle length and eccentric strength. So here we're going to take a look at uh, a conventional model of how hamstring strength exercises tend to be progressed throughout rehab. So generally speaking, these exercises are split. And at the start of rehab, most rehab protocols will introduce isometric loading and then gradually progress to in, in, in implement more eccentric exercises as part of rehabilitation. The main barrier to getting from isometric to eccentric is often being pain-free or the resolution of pain during isometric knee flexion. Now, when we designed our rehab protocol, we actually decided not to implement isometric exercise and we actually implemented eccentric exercise from the start of rehabilitation. And rather than waiting for the resolution of pain on isometric contractions to guide when we actually progress this eccentric loading, what we did is we used what we call an exercise specific progression model, where once the athletes could safely perform that exercise through the prescribed repetition range, we then added uh, more challenging variations. So as you can see here, the unilateral slider and the Nordic hamstring exercise uh, were added at that point. What we did with the data with our 43 participants from that RCT, we went back and had a look at how long it actually took them to progress from this bilateral slider to the unilateral variation and to the Nordic hamstring exercise and compare this to how long it took them to be pain-free on an isometric strength test, which we also collected throughout rehabilitation. And what we can see from this figure here on the y-axis, we have the percentage of participants achieving each of those milestones, combining both the pain-free and the pain threshold group together. On the x-axis, the number of days from hamstring strain injury. What you can see in the light grey is that the progression of eccentric loading occurs significantly earlier 
than how long it actually took them to be pain-free on an isometric contraction. And this was on average seven days earlier, meaning you basically we were able to Im- implement or accelerate eccentric loading by one week uh, during hamstring injury rehab. And you might think one week isn't a very long period of time. However, if we factor in we've got return to play clearance times of just over two weeks, then being able to accelerate exposure to eccentric loading a week earlier really is clinically significant in terms of actually um, hopefully eliciting adaptation. Now, it's one thing to do these exercises a little bit earlier. We also want to have a look at how well they were tolerated. If we have a look at our eccentric exercises compared to our isometric strength test, we can actually look at how many participants reported pain the first time they tried them. So firstly, looking at the bilateral slider, the majority of participants were pain-free. For the unilateral slider, we had a few more participants report pain, but still the majority were completely pain-free. And surprisingly, with the Nordic hamstring exercise, around 80% of our participants, the first time that exercise was introduced, were able to perform it completely pain-free. But if we compare that to that same session where they first performed those eccentric exercises, and we take a look at the pain during an isometric, we actually see the opposite, that about 80% was still reporting pain during an isometric knee flexor strength test. We suggest that normally we'd be holding these athletes back from progressing, when in actual fact they're able to perform these exercises safely. We could also have a look at some objective strength data, which we collected during all of these exercises. And we could look at injured leg relative to uninjured leg in terms of knee flexor force output on the y-axis. This green zone represents 90% and above or within 10% deficit. And then what we can see is from the bilateral slider, the unilateral slider, and the Nordic hamstring exercise, the first time participants performed these, the majority sat well and truly within between limb uh, symmetry, with the average being close to 100% across all of them. The same session, if we look at the isometric strength tests, we see the opposite. Most people have a strength deficit, which normally practitioners would look at and say, you're not ready to go and do an eccentric exercise. However, this data suggests uh, that that type of progression criteria probably isn't valid and we should be progressing more on an individual and exercise-based model. So to summarise that last little point there, what we've also been able to show with this data set is, yes, we can safely progress or safely accelerate the introduction of progressive hamstring loading during rehabilitation by taking a more exercise-specific approach uh, to the way that we implement these, uh, these exercises and interventions. It's important to also take note that this is just one piece of the pie when it comes to hamstring injury rehab, and we also need a lot more participant numbers to know what the true outcome is with this sort of approach on things like re-injury in the long term. Just to finish off, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, particularly Dr. David Opar, uh, Dr. Rod Simmons and Dr. Narav Mania, who um, were instrumental in conducting this study, along with all the study uh, participants uh, who were involved uh, in this study um, over the last few years. So thanks very much for listening, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations.